Welcome everybody to this session on designing for multi-cloud. My name is Mark. I'm the product manager at Pivotal. I'm working on the service brokers with the public clouds. Um, our, our team developed the service broker for AWS. We'll talk a bit about that and the experiences. Uh, Google is here later in this week. They're going to present um, their service broker and demo that. And uh, we've been working with Azure as well. So by the end of this year, I probably will have service book is connecting to all of these three clouds. A little bit about what is multi-cloud and why it's important. This is the Wikipedia definition. Multiple cloud computing services in a single heterogeneous architecture. And you'll see that as we talk about the examples, the people are using this fairly loosely. We're not trying to say that multi-cloud is something where you want to put all your applications distributed across them. People are using multi-cloud in certain ways. The, the main objective was to reduce reliance on a single vendor, so re reduce lock-in. But in fact, people are using cost as, as a justification to move to another cloud. And people are using fitting the workload to the services in a particular cloud as a reason for moving. <laughs> and this differs from hybrid cloud, uh, which is really a deployment model. But this is not about deployment models. That was, there's a single vendor cloud that can give you those different deployment models. This is about using different clouds. We'll have some time for questions at the end. This is probably the most important point I want to make today, is that a cloud strategy provides you and enables economies of scale, but a multi-cloud strategy enables economies of arbitrage. And part of the reason for that is that today, the difference, the spread of cost for a set of compute instances varies by as much as 80% across these cloud vendors. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to, instead of paying a dollar, to pay 20 cents. And you have to be able to ready yourself to move um, for the right application. Why your businesses will demand money clouds is A, it's cheaper, right? And the cost of cloud computing has been dropping over the years. More than 80% typically of your cloud costs our compute resources and the charging granularity between uh, providers. Some people charge by the hour, others charge by the minute or the second. So the cost can make a big difference. And you'll see that your competitors will, will already moving to this model, especially in North America. Clouds is still emerging here uh, in terms of having it geographically available, but the same issues will happen here. Give you a few examples um, that you may have heard about. Dropbox, which was actually implemented in public cloud with HP's uh, assistance, has moved to hybrid cloud to reduce cost. Now they haven't moved everything, they've moved a portion of it. But this is the kind of use case where people are moving from one cloud to another provider to lower cost. Johnson & Johnson is another example a Fortune 100 company moved a lot of data to AWS, uh, Azure, and NTT, and they have no mainframe now, right? Imagine that. And they plan to have 85% of their apps in the cloud in two years. And in an example where um, customers uh, are using new services in the cloud, GCP came out last month with preemptible VMs for 20% of the cost of a regular VM. And already a number of customers have found ways to use this to move their workload across clouds. And they can actually move it back and forth as necessary, not every day, but as the contracts change. So what is the pattern of usage that we're seeing with customers who are doing multi-cloud? They're choosing two to three cloud partners not one, because that's lock-in, not five, because that's too complicated. They're focusing their efforts either on something that's highest cost or something that's highest growth. They're trying to fit the workload to the cloud service, right? And that's an important part of this. And they're learning how to leverage new computing infrastructure offerings, right? So for example, we talked about the preemptible VMs, new service that came out. There's a number of different customers who've moved to that. 
I want to talk a bit about cloud brokering because that's really the approach that we're using. It was identified by Gartner in 2009. And they identified different types of brokering, intermediation where you were providing the same kind of service wrapped to your customer, aggregation where you, com you were combining some services and, and providing it to the customer, and arbitrage where you would essentially take a compute from one and finding a cheaper cloud. And they thought this would be a business rather than software, right? So if you're a cloud broker, how many of you are there in the room? None, right? So Gartner doesn't always get it right. <laughs> but they, 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 they thought this would be a business, and really we're building this cloud brokering capability in kind of foundry these days. So it's not a business. Software has already disrupted this one. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Service Broker API. There's a few, so I apologize if you already know this stuff. But I'm going to walk you through the concepts of what we've done. Because using multi-cloud fits really, really well with the Service Broker concept in Cloud Foundry. So a Service Broker is essentially something you write once. You write one Service Broker, and when you install it, it, it can have multiple services. So the approach that we've taken that everybody's taken in, in Google and Azure is you install one service broker and yet it will install the cloud services for that particular cloud in your marketplace. So if you install two brokers, one from AWS and one from Azure, you will see in the marketplace side by side services that allow you to go and create from the CF command line a database in RDS on AWS or a database in Azure. Right? And that's a pretty powerful concept. Right? You as a developer being able to select which cloud you're going to use. And customers are starting to realize that maybe they can use Google for development or GCP, but maybe they want their, maybe their production environment is on AWS. Right? These are cost decisions they're making, performance decisions. We're going to talk about service plans because each service can have multiple service plans. And we'll talk a little bit about how DevOps can is simplified by this and made more secure by this. Because one of the concepts of all of these is how do you manage credentials? Right, so in the service broker, the broker actually keeps the credentials. The operator installs the broker. The developer never needs to worry about credentials. You're just gonna go into your command line. You've already been given access to an organ space. The broker already knows what credentials it's going to use, and it's going to tag them with your particular details, right? So it really simplifies setting up anything in AWS or in um, Azure or any of the clouds. <coughs> We're going to talk about each one of these, um, but let's start with the service brokers. There are four operations that are kind of typical for the service broker. Create service, which creates your database instance. Uh, bind service, which is binding your app and getting credentials back from the broker. Unbind service, the delete service. And then CF Marketplace is really where the broker places the services into the marketplace and you can list them all. <coughs> so a service broker can implement multiple services, each with multiple service plans. And really these service plans are custom or predefined configurations. So think about what you can now set up. As an operator, we have customers who want to define their policies. So for example, they want storage encryption across the board. Or maybe they want storage encryption on certain plans. <coughs> they can go in and actually declare that as a specific type of plan. So you can have a configuration of use for development. You can have a configuration that you use for production, or several configurations. And all the developer has to do is pick one. Say, I want to use that plan and it gets created along with all of the settings, the app settings, the VPC, the security groups that you would use in the typical, the typical cloud. So again, it makes it very, very easy for you to list what services are available, what plans are available, and go off and create those. Basically, this provisioning is a feature that was added in the last year that really makes it possible for us to use this concept of go provision something and then check the status of it. Right? So it enables you to create resources, 
VMs, databases, and check on the status. Uh, and the other concept that we had a lot of interest in was being able to add what we call arbitrary parameters at the point at which you create the instance. So a lot of times the operator has set up plans that maybe aren't quite perfect for you. You want to increase the cache, or you want to increase the size of the database. And so being able to at create instance type time change the parameters is something you can do on the fly, on the command line. So you can see here that we can add tags, we can pick a region, we can change some of the things in the broker when you're creating the database instance. The other concept that kind of came up and we've leveraged service keys in Cloud Foundry is that app developers sometimes want to do more than just create the database instance to delete it or buy it or unbuy it. Uh, they may want to list the tags on it. They may want to um, create a snapshot of the database. And so we could use service keys to get temporary credentials that then allow you to use the data of, uh, cloud CLI. So in the case of AWS, you'll go out and get your keys, and then you can use that in the existing AWS CLI. What this gives you is a consistent experience for DevOps. So PCF operators, again, can set policies and create the service plans. App developers use existing create, bind, update, and delete commands. And then you can do one-time tasks and other management via service keys. Right, so one service broker per IS, multiple services per cloud. And that's how you get to multi -cloud. Now there's a bunch of activity going on in different service brokers for multi-cloud. We've got the uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry service broker for AWS that we're building. We've got the Azure service broker, which is in GitHub, it's open source. Uh, we've got the service broker for GCP, which they're going to demo here this week. Um, and they're going to release that, I think, next month, but definitely by end of year. And we've also got ATF, which has an open source service broker. Um, I believe they only built it for AWS at this time. So, just to kind of summarize in terms of multi-cloud, you can build your own service brokers as well. There's no constraint, it's an open platform. Anybody can build their own um, service broker. We have customers who built their own AWS service brokers and are using our service broker for other services. Cloud Foundry is the best platform for enterprise workloads and multi-cloud. Make sure you tell everybody that. Uh, we want you to adopt and use service brokers. Look for cloud arbitrage opportunities because there is a lot of opportunity today as you move it to cloud to figure out which cloud and which service to put your applications on. And ask me and others about multi-cloud here at the conference. Um, from where we see the, tr the, the, tra the, the trends today, North America customers are a little bit further ahead in using multi-cloud, but the costs of savings, the arbitrage opportunities, the workloads, the performance means that that's going to come as data centers get built here as well. Thank you. And we got some time for questions, so I think there's a mic somewhere in the room. Feel free to. Uh... Just put your hand up if you have a question. Sorry, again. Can you also share some problems or challenges you faced when moving from one cloud to another? Um, so, one of the things that gets more complicated. Um, as you have more clouds, is really the security aspects, right? Because you really don't want to just go ahead and use a cloud and have you know public um, ex access to your databases. You've got to set up you know your private connection. You have to set up firewall rules. So setting up the security and learning that security for each of the clouds you use is is, is important, and it is different, right? So um, fortunately. The cloud providers are pretty good about giving you uh, best practices. 
Uh, but that is definitely one challenge, is making sure that you have the best practices in place for each cloud. Um, I'd say the, the second challenge is probably around the maturity of these clouds. So not all the features that you need um, are available on all clouds. Right? They're coming, but not, not, none of them are. Um, and tagging is, is an example that is absolutely critical for anybody on AWS. Right? We have enterprise customers who refuse to install this without tagging because they need to know what instance, when they have a thousand databases and, and compute instances, they need to know what application is using it. Uh, so that's available on AWS and Azure right now. Uh, GCP is still got to add that. Uh, different clouds have different ways of grouping applications. So that's a consideration as well. Uh, but it's a trade-off. Like right now, there's a big uh, value to using some clouds in certain ways. Uh, you'll see a, a number of announcements of that. I you really found companies to save money by being multi-cloud. Because like when I'm observing prices, they all seem to be going down in a very short term, the same way. The, so the prices are going down, but the spread is literally <coughs> 20 to 100. Okay. So you can, you, can, you can get essentially the same amount of compute for 80% less. So that's a big, that's a big saving. So especially when you're using you know, a lot of compute for machine learning or model training and things like that. Like petabytes of data on objects, well then you start saving. Yeah, storage is not as big as compute. The storage costs are pretty minimal. Right? It's the compute costs. Pretty much everybody is 80 to 90% compute cost. What was the question there? So this was about service brokers and how about the Elastic Runtime? I mean, this is where the applications are. Yeah, um, so for us, the service brokers are actually written as apps. So they run in Elastic Runtime, right? So they get all the, the, the value of Elastic Runtime. Uh, but we don't actually do any, anything fancy. We're just a regular app that runs in Elastic Runtime. So the Elastic Runtime is still in one cloud? Um, for each foundation or cluster, but if you're running in different clouds, then there's one running in each cloud. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, let me ask you a question. I mean, um, how many of you are thinking of using multi-cloud? It's kind of a show of hands. A small, small number, less than 10% at the moment. Be interesting to see that in a year. <laughs> it will be higher. Some of us are service providers. Some of you are service providers, yes. So you really don't want anybody else's cloud, you just want yours. <laughs> yes. It's going to end up very much the same way that people do um, run their internet bandwidth, right? They buy one line from you and one line from the other, and that's my redundancy. That's, that's kind of what is going is to happen ultimately. But in the short term, between now and then, when it matures, there's cloud arbitrage is leading the game. So there's, there's a bunch of deals. People are moving, people are using multiple clouds. Uh, so multi cloud is definitely a thing, it's only going to get bigger. Right? So being able to use Cloud Foundry as the platform and being able to write your own service brokers or leverage service brokers, that's really where the innovation is. It's where the productivity savings is going to be. Being able to leverage other people's brokers rather than having to write your own. That's a huge, huge plus. You don't have to learn all the lessons that you know, the original author had to learn in building that. Um, one of the other lessons we kind of learned was really in the building of service plans. People really want flexibility in that. So it's not enough to have one or two service plans. You want to have pre-built uh, best practices. For example, databases, we all know what small, medium, large looks like in an enterprise database. We all know in production you want backups and multi-AZ, but in development you probably don't. Right? And then being able to allow the users to, or the operators to customize is really important as well. Right? Because that's the flexibility. All right, I 
if there's no more questions, thank you very much for your time.